For as long as we've had stuff, we found ways to bring it along. Fatty started off big, but it got small, portable. Now one person can carry more than ever. And more stuff like clothes, toilet sheets, fancy little dogs, you know, necessities. But what's amazing is how much stuff you drive around that you don't need and don't like. Things that trip us up, wear us out, and pops us in. Stuff like me. Keep dropping, keep throwing, keep letting go so you can take hold of something better. God's best for your life. And for that, you're going to need both hands. We run fastest, love fullest, and live lightest when we let go. Of the baggage. Yeah. Yeah, you can clap for that. Baggage. It's heavy. I've got a secret I want to share with you today. I love to travel. That's not my secret. The secret is I'm, I'm, not, a very, I'm not very good at packing for that travel. I feel like I need to turn in my man card just to admit that to you, but it's true. I'm not very good at packing. My wife is the true genius in our house in that department. We went on a trip uh, over spring break. We went out to Washington, D.C., and uh, here's how it worked in, in our house. She spent, my wife spent, the, oh, probably two weeks before we left just getting ready for the trip, thinking through what we were going to need, packing exactly what we needed, not just for her, but for our five kids as well. She thought through the trip, and uh, she remembered that, uh, she knew that we were going to have access to a washer and dryer about halfway through the week, and so she packed light. She got three clothes, or three outfits, I think, for each of the kids, maybe that many or a few more for herself, and uh, she even thought through what to pack so that we would just have to throw it all into the laundry together. We didn't have to sort the clothes. And so when I got home the night before the trip, there was a nice, neat pile of baggage waiting for me by the front door. It's my job to load that up into the minivan before we leave. The problem is I couldn't do it yet because at that point you would have found me upstairs in our bedroom hastily throwing together my own baggage. Um, I was never a Boy Scout, but I completely bought into their motto, always be prepared. And so here's my problem with packing. I'm standing there in front of the bed, and I'm thinking through everything that could possibly happen this week. It might rain, so I'm going to need a raincoat. Well, it might get chilly at night, so I better grab a sweatshirt. Well, I might spill something on that sweatshirt, so I better grab two. And before you know it, I've got this big old pile of clothes and stuff like flashlights. I didn't need flashlights. And so I grab this big pile of stuff, and I'm stumbling down the staircase, and I come to the front door and drop this pile of baggage next to the nice, neat pile. And it's only in that moment that I recognize what everybody else in my family already knows, that my pile for just me is almost as big as the pile for the six other people in our house. That's a problem. But the real problem comes in at the end of the trip when everybody else is able to take their little bag, nice neat bag of luggage, and they bring it upstairs and just kind of dump it out into the laundry bin. 
Not me. I have to unpack what I packed on the front end. I mean, some of those clothes are still nice and neat and folded in the bag. I didn't touch them all week long. Well, I did touch them. Not in the bag, really outside the bag, as I was loading and unloading and repacking that silly van probably at least three times. Unnecessarily, I had to handle all of that extra heavy baggage. I wonder how many of us do that same exact thing with our lives. We're carrying around baggage from our past. We're in this series on the family. So today we're talking about family baggage. We're going to zero in on that baggage that comes to us from our family of origin. I want to help you think through what this might possibly be for you. We have some folks who have been very honest here at Northview and shared some of their baggage. And so I'm going to invite you right now to watch the screens, listen to this segment that we call Ask Northview. Because it was business, business, business. Uh, they're not married anymore. Um, so they pursue different relationships. Well, my father did. So that's not as just. Really poor communication, um, language barrier. And my dad was, <coughs> excuse me, an American GI. Married my mom in the Vietnam War. Um, clash of cultures, clash of personalities, uh, just clash. My dad was unfaithful to my mom. Um, so I saw a lot of fighting. Uh, my dad would, would leave for a while, and um, my mom was just very emotionally unstable, and I kind of became her stability at a very young age. They sort of like kind of lived a little bit like independent lives, I guess, in the same house. And it wasn't that they, you know, it wasn't a terrible story, but they just sort of did their own thing. You know, my mother did her card clubs. My dad did his poker nights. Uh, you know, but they just didn't do quite as much together. Conflict in my family was handled with my dad had the last say. Like my mom really didn't argue a lot with him, and if she did, he would get angry. And because he was the head of the household, no one could really have a differing opinion from him. Um, he wasn't cruel, but it was you weren't allowed to speak your mind. I would say the conflict wasn't handled very well. I'd say. Uh, and the arguments, uh, I, I didn't see them ever work it out. Between my mom and dad, my mom, again, she avoided conflict at all costs. So there typically wasn't any. The few times there was, um, well, then my dad just lived with them around. Watching how my father modeled uh, back then and the way he is today, he would, uh, he would get very angry. And, and I know that I have come by that honestly as a kid, but it's been a big struggle in our own marriage is how I handle that with the, the outburst of anger and those types of things. So that's kind of how conflict was managed in our lives. That's, that was how it was modeled for me. I don't think it was handled that well. I, I think things were swept under the rug. Uh, I think if emotions were shared, they were shared and then time went by and things were, ne were not dealt with, so they were just stored up. Conflict in my family was handled with a lot of volume and a lot of energy and a lot of emotion. Uh, things tended to uh, be very quiet and steady, kind of like that rumbling volcano, and then uh, uh, come out very explosively. Yeah, thanks, guys, for your honesty. Just so we're clear right up front, I want to tell you where we're heading with this message. I crafted a bit of a thesis statement. I just wanted to make sure I knew exactly where we were heading with this. I want to share that with you. I'm calling this the baggage claim. It's a really bad pun. I actually sat in my office for about 10 minutes, staring at my computer screen, deciding, am I going to go with that? You see where I landed. It's cheesy, but I think it works. Here's our baggage claim today. Let's recognize that we were shaped in some profound ways by that incubator we grew up in. Let's also recognize that there's no baggage that's too heavy for our Lord to lift. 
let's recognize that those first 17, 18, 19, maybe for some of us more, years that we spent with our family of origin, it did shape us in some profound ways. Some good ways and some bad ways. There are quite potentially are some hurts and habits and hang-ups, maybe even some patterns of repetitive sin that are in our lives today that began as a pattern back then. Let's just be honest. But at the same time, as believers in Jesus Christ, we have hope. We have hope that Jesus is able to redeem, even looking backwards, redeem our past. Gives us hope for a better future. As we approach baggage today, I'm thinking of three questions that we need to address. There is a what question, there's a why question, and there's a how question. We're going to look at it in that order. Let's start first with the what question. The what question is, what does my baggage look like? Well, you would say, Stan, it's black, it's got a handle. No, 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 I'm not talking about that baggage. I'm talking about from my past. And I would invite you to do some self-introspection. What does your baggage look like? What are you carrying around that has become oh so heavy? Now, there are several different kinds of baggage as we examine this question of what. By the way, I would encourage you to think of this question as the most important question we're going to deal with today. What is my baggage? That's a simple question, but don't make the mistake of treating it as a simplistic question. It actually requires a fair amount of work to uncover some of those stones in your life, peek underneath them. There are several different kinds of baggage, and I would, in my life anyway, categorize them like this. There is some baggage from my family, from my past, that I am aware of. Somebody has lovingly pointed it out to me at some point in my life, a while back, or maybe even I discovered it. I might have even recognized some of that stuff as a child. This isn't right. Something about this doesn't just, it just doesn't seem quite right. I'm aware and I've been working on it. That's really not the baggage we're talking about today. Good for you. If you've got some of that that you've claimed and, and you're working on, that, that's good. What we're gonna talk about today is the baggage that we are maybe not aware of, we haven't thought of, or maybe that which we've just very recently become aware of, and we need to take some action steps toward letting that baggage go. I wanna tell you about my last week. Um, they say that when you work on a message, oftentimes a message works on you, and that has, in fact, been happening to me this last week. As I've been studying this topic and thinking about it, there's been some kind of light bulbs go off in my brain. Last Sunday, uh, many of you, I know, were here this past weekend. We've been preaching through this series. Steve preached last weekend uh, on parenting, and I sat right over there at, during the 11 o'clock hour, took copious notes because we have five kids and I'm always looking for some good advice on parenting. Good message on parenting. Bad day to be a parent, quite honestly. I don't want to say too much. I'm choosing my words here very carefully. But we, we have five good kids. They're good kids. They were not being good that day. If you know what I'm saying. It was a rough day. I don't want to over, I, I can't overstate it. it. It was a rough day. We found ourselves uh, that night back in the minivan driving back to the church. There was a life group leader appreciation banquet that night. My wife and I had been looking forward to coming to it. And, uh, you know, we were excited to come and be here. And we were walking into the door, and my wife turned and looked at me and said, I can't do it. And she turned around and walked back across the lobby, and I followed her. We ended up finding this um, bench outside on our property, and we sat there for about an hour just talking through the day. She shared with me that, saying, I, I can't go in there and, and just, you know, put a smile on my face and uh, act like everything's okay because it's not. This has been a very difficult day. She was right. Well, we talked for an hour. We ended up coming back into the event, caught the end of it. It was a great event. Went home that night and had a family meeting, came up with some action steps. It ended well. But the next day, I was telling this story to a friend of mine who knows me fairly well. And uh, I shared with him that there was this conflict happening inside of my heart for the first 15 minutes of that conversation. Here's the thing. I decided in my head a long time ago that there is kind of a pecking order in my life for my attention, for my loyalty, 
My God is first. I would put my, my family second. Even in that, I would divide that. I would put my, my wife above my children. And then after my family, I would place my ministry and what I do for God. That's the pecking order in my life. I've put some time and some you know, intention, intentional thought into that, studying scripture to come up with that list. And in that moment, I knew that my, my responsibility in this moment is to be a husband, to listen. But I shared with my friend, all I could think of was I need to get back in there. I shouldn't be out here sitting on this bench. I'm a pastor at this church. I should be in there putting a smile on my face, acting as if everything's okay. But you see, it wasn't. It wasn't okay. My friend, I believe, has a spiritual gift of wisdom, and he was insightful. He pointed out to me, he knows a bit of my past. He said, Stan, is it possible that, because I shared with him, I said, I feel this burden all the time. Oftentimes at church, I feel like it's my responsibility to be the thermostat for the room. I have to kind of set the tone or the mood, the temperature for the rest of the, the room. I feel this burden, and if I'm not there, I, then I feel guilty. He said, is it possible that this goes back to your childhood? He knows a bit of my story. He knows that my mother, well, well, she was diagnosed with cancer when I was in fifth grade. And she ultimately passed away from that horrible disease my senior year of high school. And for those seven years in between, he knows because I've told him that I was the oldest of the four kids and I felt the burden to take care of them, and their feelings, their hurts, their habits, their hangups. Is it possible that I'm walking some of that into my adult life today? I feel that burden. And it was as if light bulbs went off and that conversation led to another conversation, ultimately led to a conversation with my wife that is very helpful. And as I've been thinking through this, I actually had this memory this last week. I remember sitting in my mother's funeral, my senior year of high school, and it was in a church building. And I was staring at the casket and the preacher read a letter that my mother had written years before. I don't think she even intended for this letter to be shared. Um, it was kind of her private grief, but she was writing to each of her kids. I'm the oldest of the four. And her words to me that were read aloud that day, almost from the grave, were, Stan, be brave. Be strong. And I remember sitting there and feeling all the eyes of these people turn and look at me. And the self-talk in my brain at that point, all I was saying over and over and over to myself was, don't cry, don't cry, don't cry. And then I over-spiritualized it. <laughs> then I uh, made it some kind of a ministry to be brave. And uh, because mom, you know, she's in heaven now. This should be a thing of joy, not a thing of sorrow. And so I didn't cry. How broken is that? Is it possible that that's still affecting me today? I believe it is. And just this past week, uh, as I'm turning over that rock and I'm looking underneath and I'm doing some self-exploration, I'm realizing some things and I'm discovering that's some baggage that I, it's time, it's time for me to deal with that. How about you? What family baggage are you still dragging around? Some of you, um, recently somebody has told you that that controlled substance, you are hitting that pretty heavy. And uh, if you were honest and you were to admit to yourself, you are finding it cunning, baffling, powerful. It has a control over your life. And then you do some kind of discovery and you're thinking through your brain, I think my dad had some issues with that as well. You know, Grandma, she kept a bottle underneath the sink. She called it her medicine. Is it possible that that's family baggage? I believe it is quite possible that that is family baggage. Some of you, maybe recently somebody's pointed out to you that um, you can't keep a secret to save your life. Well, let's call that what it is. The scriptures talk about that. They call it gossip. It's a sin. You think about that and you think backwards through your family of origin and you remember that uh, your mom did some of this. She called it prayer requests. The phone would ring, it would come in. And then very quickly, that prayer request would go right back out. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> is it possible that that is baggage? Yeah, I think it could be. Maybe your issue is anger. I don't know. But the most important step is to claim it. Step one, the first question we're asking is, what does my baggage look like? Here's the thing. I'm going to invite you to reach up right now in the seat back in front of you and pull out one of these baggage 
tickets, these baggage tags that we have there. And I'm going to invite you right now to go ahead and write on it. What is your baggage? Go ahead and claim it. Write it down. Maybe you can't think of it right now. It's going to take you a few minutes. Uh, you just feel free through the rest of the message. If you have that kind of inspiration moment, go ahead and take a moment and write it down claim it. Now, let me tell you, we're not going to do anything with these. We're not going to make you come up front and put these on display anywhere. This really is between you and God. And so you can be honest. Please be honest before God. I'm going to take this and put it someplace to remind me. I've written on mine thermostat. That means something to me from the story I just shared with you. I'm going to put this somewhere to remind me this is something I need to be working on. I need to put some energy toward this. The first question, the most important question, is what does my baggage look like? Second question. This is kind of a fun question. The question is, why am I dragging it around? This is a philosophic question or even a question of theology in the church. We've been wondering about this for a long time now. Now, as... um, we talk about the question of why, I think it's important to point out that usually we land in one of two what I would call extremes in relating with our baggage. The first extreme is this. Way over here, I think some of us have a tendency to ignore the baggage. We ignore it. We say, well, I came to Jesus. He made everything all better. My past? What past? No, 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 no. I'm not even going to deal with it because, well, I'm, I'm in Jesus now. It's kind of like getting into a car accident and you're having this big old gash in the side of your car and they're just filling it up with Bondo with that uh, putty that they sell. And well, it's all good. Well, maybe. <laughs> That's not a permanent solution. It will fall apart eventually. Now, we over-spiritualize this extreme, the ignoring extreme. We point to passages of Scripture like 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17, that says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, you've heard this before, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. Now, I believe we are a new creation in Christ. I believe that all Scripture is God-breathed, but I don't think you can pull this out of context and use this to support this extreme. As a matter of fact, I would point out That the same person that wrote this, the Apostle Paul, he also wrote some other things in some other scriptures. In Romans chapter 7, verse 15, he said, in this very autobiographical moment, as he shared honestly from his heart to the people he's writing to, he says, I do not, he's speaking of himself, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. I think what he's talking about here, some of that baggage. Those hurts, habits, and hang-ups, the sin issues in his life that he's been struggling with for a while, but he just can't quite kick the habit. He's being very honest. Yeah, he's a new creation in Christ, but there's still something from his past he has to deal with. He also says in Philippians chapter 2, verse 12, by the way, I believe that the book of Philippians is one of the last books that the Apostle Paul writes. I think it's toward the end of his life. And so we can kind of follow this timeline of his life, and we see by the end of his life, I think he's still thinking along these same lines. In Philippians chapter 2, he says this to the people he's writing there. Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, indicating that this, well, this is process-oriented. Yeah, I'm a new creation in Christ, but I can't ignore that stuff. It's time to deal with it. That's one extreme. The other extreme we would find all the way over here, and we'll call this the blame game, or simply blame. This is an extreme. Now, we come by this position in the church honestly because we find it in Scripture. Actually, Jesus' very own disciples, those people that he spent all that time with pouring his life into, they landed in this extreme at least at one point. We find this in John chapter 9, verses 1 through 3. As he, Jesus, went along... He saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. This baggage he has, it's an opportunity. 
It's an opportunity to glorify God. Listen to that thought. There's hope to be found in that thought. So do you get what his disciples are asking? Okay, this guy is blind. It's got to be somebody's fault. Somebody's to blame. Either he sinned, and he's blind because of it, or his parents sinned, and he's blind because of it. Where do they get that idea? I actually think they get this idea from the Old Testament. Have you ever heard of the concept of generational sin? I think it's true, but I think misconstrued, it can really put us over here in this camp very quickly of playing the blame game. I think they get this idea of all places from the Ten Commandments. In Exodus chapter 20, God shares with his people, here's how I want you to live. And if you live this way, your life's going to be better, I promise. The first two of the Ten Commandments are all about idolatry. Don't worship anybody else. I'm the one true God, he says. Then the other eight are all about um, these things, these sin issues that we chase after. Martin Luther, the reformer, Martin Luther, believed that those eight were actually redundant of the first two. Actually, if you get right worship right, if you don't have idols in your life, then the others kind of go away. Basically, his premise was that when you chase after coveting, when you chase after adultery, when you chase after stealing, all of those other of the Ten Commandments, that when you do that, you're creating a functional savior for yourself, which actually is idolatry. In the context of worshiping idols, God gives this instruction to his people. Exodus chapter 20, verses 4 and following, he says, You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. And here's where they get this. Punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. Now, this gets repeated at least two other times I can find in those first five books of the Old Testament, the Pentateuch, the law. That's what Jesus' disciples would have referred to this section of Scripture as. And they placed high value on this section of Scripture. It's repeated in your notes. If you want to look it up, we're not going to deal with it now. But almost verbatim, you can find that same language in Exodus 34 and Numbers 14. Now, there's a couple of ways to look at this. I think you can look at it through the lens that God intended it. He is speaking in that three and four generation language. He is speaking directly to the first generation. He's talking to parents. He's saying, parents, be be so very careful. Because this home you have, it's a little seminary. You have the opportunity to raise your kids for the Lord. You have incredible influence on them. Be careful, because as you sin, it can have lasting effects on their kids, their kids' kids. You get the idea. Now, the problem is, once you get to the third and fourth generation, or the 20 or 30th generation in the disciples' case, and you start looking backwards up the family tree, you see there's potential to be playing the blame game. That's just not helpful to anybody. But there's this concept of generational sin, and we're still asking the question, why? Why is it that I have to drag this baggage around? And the answer, well, it's part of our humanity. Let's let's just normalize this a little bit, shall we? Listen, everybody has a weird uncle. I mean, everybody has somebody in their family tree they're they're not overly proud of. Every family on some level has some dysfunction. Every family. It's normal. Everybody has hurts, habits, hang-ups, because we all sin. We can normalize this even further if we were to look specifically at Jesus' family tree. We don't have time to read through it, but if you wanted to go to the very beginning of the New Testament, Matthew chapter 1, it's on page 669 in the seats underneath you. I'd encourage you to scan through this list. There are some stinkers in that list, right? There's, there's a prostitute that belongs to Jesus' family tree. There are some people who struggle with all kinds of sin, cheating, lying, some horrible things in that list. Let's normalize this. It's part of our humanity. Actually, if you were to take a close look at that list, I'm talking just a few verses into the New Testament. 
You'll notice that the first four names on that list, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Judah, that family tree, I mean, we can't look at all of those generations closely because their story is not told in detail in the Bible, but that family's is. The book of Genesis follows the story of that family. There's some generational sin that takes place in that family. It starts with Abraham. Abraham had this issue. Now, the Bible, in the New Testament, it's, it, we're told that, um, that uh, Abraham believed in God, had faith in God, and that was credited to him as righteousness. He was a righteous man. He still struggled with sin. He had hurts, habits, and hang-ups. One of them was lying. Ladies, can you imagine this? Abraham, on two different times, two different occasions in the Old Testament, Somebody comes to him, and, and uh, actually they, they, they approach his wife, and they're kind of hitting on his wife. And two times, in an act of cowardice, he says, she's not my wife, she's my sister. And that impacts, I'm sure, his kids. They, they see that, and they hear that. And his son Isaac and his wife, their marriage is marked by deception and deceit and lying. You follow it to the next generation, Jacob, their son. Jacob's very name means deception, deceit trickster, lying. You go to the next generation and there's all kinds of lying that's taken place in the story of the fourth generation. There's uh, an issue of, of favoritism that the parents are showing to the different kids in that family tree. Abraham and his wife Sarah, they have two kids, Ishmael and Isaac. Ishmael becomes the father of the Arab peoples. Isaac becomes the father of the Jewish people. There's still sibling rivalry taking place today and wars happening between those two groups of people. But you follow that down through the generations. Favoritism leads to sibling rivalry. And each of the generations, first four generations of that family, deal with that issue. It culminates finally in the fourth generation. Judah is mentioned. He's one of ten brothers that because they're so jealous of their one brother, Joseph, because he's daddy's favorite, they try to kill him. And they end up selling him off into slavery. Sibling rivalry. There's a generational pattern there. Why? Is it nature? Is it nurture? <laughs> it's kind of a fun question to think about. We've got a little experiment like that happening in our own house. We have five kids. One of our kids, uh, whether it's nature or nurture, he can blame us for both. And we have uh, four kids we've adopted. And so we've got this little, it's kind of fun to watch that. You wonder how much of this is nature or nurture. But honestly, as fun as it is to think about that, that's not real helpful. Why is not the best question? As I said before, what is the best question? What are their specific hurts, habits, and hangups? What is their baggage that we can help them with? And as I examine my own life, what's, what is my baggage? And then the second most helpful question we're going to wrestle with is How? Can we do something about this? The how question. The question is, how do I unpack it? Now, here's the thing. I can't be very specific in the application here. Because quite honestly, I don't know what you have written down on that luggage tag. I don't need to know. I don't want to know unless you choose to share it with me. Honestly, that's between you and God. And as many tags as there are in this space, that's how many different specific action steps need to take place. But what, what I can do for you is give you some broad principles on how to unpack this. Now, these uh, that I'm gonna give you, they're, they're not my principles. Actually, uh, I'm borrowing these from somebody else. I've got a couple of resources I, I wanna share with you. This is a, a book I found very helpful. It's called The Emotionally Healthy Church. It's written by uh, Peter Scazzaro. Um, Pete is a, uh, a pastor, um, and uh, one day his wife came to him and said, I'm leaving the church. And uh, he said, why? Good question. And she said, because I don't respect the pastor. That's a problem. He, why? Well, because you've got all of these hurts, habits, and hang-ups from your past. Your baggage is weighing you down, and it's affecting your leadership. It's affecting your life, affecting the, the people around you. It's not healthy. You need to get some help. And he did. And it's been a redemptive process, and God's used him in some amazing ways. He's written a couple of books. His church is growing and thriving. I would highly recommend this book to you, The Emotionally Healthy Church. While I'm talking about resources, um, I should share this one with you. This is called uh, What Your Childhood Memories Say About You. And then it's subtitled, And What You Can Do About It. 
It's written by a Christian psychologist. His name is Dr. Kevin Lehman. I happen to know both of these. You, they can order for you in Capstone. I think they sold out of the copies they had, but they can order it for you and get them for you pretty quickly. I want to share with you these three broad principles, and I, I just I want to encourage you. You might want to write these down. These are from um, Pete Scazzaro's book, The Emotionally Healthy Church. The first one is this. Identify how your family shaped you. Spend some time turning over the rocks in your memories and in your past kind of actually gets to the first question we talked about, what? This should help you identify what, what is my baggage. Here's some of the questions he encourages us to kind of process through and to think about. Here's one. He says, describe each family member with three adjectives and their relationships. He says, describe your parents' relationship. He, he, uh, he says, uh, how was conflict handled in your family? Is there anger? Tensions, you heard some of our Ask Northview people share the answer to that question. Here's a good one. How were gender roles and authority worked out in your family? There could be some baggage attached to that. How well did you see your family do in talking about feelings? How would your family describe you? How do you think your family thinks about you? It's a self-awareness question. Were there any family secrets, such as pregnancy out of wedlock, incest, or major financial scandal? What was considered success in your family? Were there any heroes or heroines in the family, scapegoats, losers? And a good question, why? Were you one of those? How has that shaped you today? That's a good question. What kinds of addictions, if any, existed in the family? Here's a question. Were there traumatic losses in the past or present, such as sudden death, prolonged illnesses, stillbirths, miscarriages, bankruptcy, or divorce? First broad principle is that to identify how your family shaped you. The second one is to discern the major influences in your life. This could be both inside the family and outside the family. But what are those major things that have shaped you? I shared with you earlier that um, my mom discovered she had cancer when I was in fifth grade. That same year, my dad graduated with his Ph.D. He was working a full-time job, going to school full-time, as an adult, looking back on that, I have to suspect that that was a very stressful time in my family of origin. And for the next seven years, there was some chaos there. I need to own that. I would be absolute foolish, absolutely foolish, if I didn't think that, that has shaped me in some pretty big ways. Let's go back to that list of genealogy. Jesus, family tree, if you were to read down uh, another paragraph or so after Abraham, you would find King David. I actually want to read this out loud to you because the way it's written is incredibly insightful. It says this, David was the father of Solomon whose mother had been Uriah's wife. That's an interesting way to phrase it, isn't it? Why? Well, because uh, it gives some insight into some family dysfunction that took place there. King David was king over Israel. Midway through his reign, he fell to moral temptation, sin. He had an extramarital affair with Uriah's wife. Her name was Bathsheba. Uriah died. David ended up, you know, marrying Bathsheba. He wrote the 51st Psalm, an act of repentance. God restored him, but there's repercussion to sin. Solomon was a child of that union. And um, I, the Bible doesn't talk about this so much, but I just wonder, I think it's human nature, don't you think it's possible there might have been a bit of whispering that took place in the palace when Solomon was a young boy? That's Solomon. It's Bathsheba's son. David fell to sexual sin. David's the father in that family. The son, Solomon, he becomes king when David dies. Solomon, uh, he had his own sexual issues. The Bible says he has 700 wives and 300 concubines. I think there might be a little bit of sexual issues there that he's uh, struggling with. 
Now, the deal is, he brings all of these wives into the kingdom. Many of them are from outside, and uh, they bring with them their own idols. Remember, we looked at that verse earlier, that the sins of the father can affect the next generations, up to the third and fourth generation. And it's about worship, false worship. Well, Solomon brings in all of these wives from outside, and as they're worshiping other gods, there's this snowball effect that takes place, and it's not long before that nation is going a different direction. They're not worshiping Yahweh God anymore, but many of them are following these false gods, these false idols. Generational sin. Now, it's said that Solomon was the uh, wisest man who ever lived. I wonder... I wonder if he was self-aware enough to look at how this was a major influence in his life. His dad felt a sexual sin. I wonder if he ever examined that in his own heart. The second broad principle is to discern the major influences in your life. And the third one, uh, the third one is to submit to becoming reparented by the church. Submit to becoming reparented by the church. Now, I've got to be honest with you. The first time I read that, I thought, really? That, that seems kind of cheesy. Almost as cheesy as my baggage claim pun. Not quite as cheesy. Really being reparented by the church. But the more I thought about that, the more I thought, that's kind of genius. You see, there's this sociological truth. I believe it's true. I I was a student minister for a long time. And and, uh, I used to tell my students, not in some kind of, you know, fatalistic fashion, but I used to tell them, you show me your friends and I'll show you your future. I think there's a certain amount of truth in that statement. I would go and visit them, high school students, at lunchtime. and I would sit at a table with the goth students. They're all dressed in black. They shape each other. I'd go sit at a table with the jocks, and they're all wearing sporty clothes and sneakers, right? I'd go and sit at a table with the cheerleaders, and if it's a pep assembly day, they're all dressed exactly the same. Our culture shapes us. I think the same is true in the church. This is why we talk so much about W plus 2. We encourage you to be relationally in worship and to be relationally in life groups and to relationally serve together because we really believe that over time that has an ability to shape us. We can be reparented by the church. You come from a dysfunctional family, let the church reparent you. That's a great strategy for the long haul. I was thinking about that this last uh, Friday night. Our, our life group was at our house, and we, were, we just started a study on parenting. And it was so encouraging for me as we talked around the circle and we shared you know, what's going on, what's working, maybe with some of our struggles. It was so encouraging and challenging for me. And then I got to thinking about this yesterday. Of course that works. Because the people around this circle, we all have our eyes fixed on Jesus. That's our long-range goal. We want to be more like him. And as we're, you know, parents for this season of our life, and we can just kind of share with each other, of course that works because we're going the same direction. It's helpful. I believe it's possible to be reparented by the church. Now, some of you are sitting there and you're saying, Stan, this thing I've written on my baggage tag, I don't have, I can't afford the luxury of years. Uh, this is crisis. We need to work on this now. I would still say that this principle works. We can be reparented by the church because I love the the analogy in Scripture that we're the family of God. Inside the family of God, there are some people who have the spiritual gift of discernment, the spiritual gift of wisdom, and they've, they've spent years working on those gifts in their life. They've gone to school. They've practiced this. They're counselors. And I don't think there's any shame in paying them to help you get some clarity in this issue. If you came to me and said, I have cancer, I would ask, are you seeing a medical doctor? You need to get treated for that. If you come to me and say, I'm struggling spiritually and I'm struggling with my emotional health, say, are you seeing a pro? They can help you with that. So if that's where you find yourself, would you call us? Give us a call here, any of our other pastors. We would love to talk to you, help you, and connect you, refer you with somebody who can help you. My email address is stan.killabrew at northviewchurch.us. Email me, and I'll help make that happen. Love to see you get connected with a professional. Well, we're back to where we started, and I want to finish by reading to you aloud that baggage claim again. This is what we said. Let's recognize that we were shaped in some profound ways by the incubator we grew up in. It's just true. 
But let's also recognize that there is no baggage too heavy for our Lord to lift. And so I want to end this time together right now by inviting our God into this process and ask him to help us do the heavy lifting. So I'm going to invite you right now to go ahead and grab that baggage tag that you've written on, and I'm going to encourage you to put it in between your hands just like this in a posture of prayer. Partly because uh, I don't want the person next to you to have to look at it, and uh, this is between you and God. You, uh, you can keep this private. But mostly because I want to commit this to prayer right now. I want to lead you through a prayer time. I'm going to pause, give you space to take your thing to God, and then we're done. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me? Our Father, God, we thank you for our families. Lord, I know that some of us in here today, when we think about our family of origin, we don't have fond feelings. But Lord, we want to be in an attitude of thankfulness. And so, if for nothing else, we thank you for our families. We thank you for the mom and the dad got together, and Lord, that you used that union to give us life. And so for our lives, we're thankful, we're grateful. And Lord, right now, I want to pause and and give space for each of us to tell you specific things we're thankful to you for our families that you've given us. And God, just now, we lift up before you inside our minds as we pray silently. We thank you for the process we're talking about. And Lord, we've written something, many of us, on this tag. And um, you know what it is. Lord, you were there as it was becoming a hurt and a habit and a hang up in our life. You've witnessed this. You know the depth of the pain in our heart as we struggle with this issue. So God, we ask you for wisdom. We ask you for courage as we seek to deal with it. God, we we give it over to you. We ask you to help us carry this. Give us specific action steps as we leave this place. In our spirit, you challenge us what we need to do next. God, we love you. We thank you that we get to be adopted into the family of God. And it's your kids, your children. We pray to you now. We say thank you, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. God bless you, Northview. Have a great week. We'll see you back again next weekend.